start our worship service. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, and I repented of my sin and won the victory. Here we go, sing it. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me the cleansing flood. Will you go to another verse? Oh, there it is. I'm not, I'm not even trying to be funny or cute. I just didn't see it in register. Should we sing? Okay, raise your hand if you know this song. You got to sing out, okay? I'm not hearing a thing up here. Come on now. There we go. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus. There you go. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me Victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. Some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. Ah, oh, thank you, Forrest. Hey, why don't you have a seat? We're going to run through a couple of announcements. You know, one of the things I love about Forrest is that he is funny when he's not even trying to be. But we so appreciate him standing in and Annie to help him look more credible. Um, in the absence of Bart, uh, for those of you that maybe didn't hear, Bart's dad passed away this past week. And so Bart is in Texas with his family. And we're just praying that God would use this whole time together to meet the needs of that family, and especially for his mom, who has not yet at this time accepted Christ as her Savior. So as you think about Bart this week and their family, would you just pray that God would move and work in hearts and comfort and encourage and bless that family, and that he would use Bart in a special way to minister not only to his mom, but to his siblings as well. 
Hey, well, we've got just a couple of announcements I wanted just to alert you to. I, I hate to tell you this, but it is the season of preparation for the great, awful tax day, April 15th. In light of that, we have your donation statements out in the uh, cafe area in a little green box, alphabetically arranged. Just stop by sometime over the next few weeks and be sure to uh, find yours. And if it's not there, if you have any questions, you can call the office and talk to Logan and uh, he will be able to take care of you. Um, I did want to just thank all of you. This is the last Sunday that we will officially be recognizing our Lottie Moon offering we had set a goal of 18000 and we are right now at $21,074. So we're so thankful for your generosity, and the Lord bless you for your giving. I uh, just want you to know that uh, you can continue to give to this offering all the year long. Anything that comes in for emissions, unless it's specifically designated for something else, will automatically go into this very same offering. But uh, we so appreciate your your faithfulness, your diligence, your intentionality in giving, and our prayers that the Lord will bless you in a special way because of that. Next Sunday, we are having a baptismal service. If anyone is interested in being a part of that and you've not talked to us yet, just call the office, set up a time. I would love to visit with you about it. Um, really, all we ask is just a, a, a kind of a testimony of how you came to know the Lord as your personal Savior, and then we just check as our Baptist distinctives require that you are baptized by immersion and once that is all taken care of then uh, we're welcome we'll welcome you into the church family but that will happen next Sunday right before the service begins and so uh, we want you to um, at least know that that's coming up in case you would like to be a part of that every now and then we have the opportunity to introduce a brand new ministry that the Lord has laid on the hearts of one of our folks and we have one to introduce this time, and Annie is going to let you know all about it. I am so excited to get to share this ministry with you all. So in September of last year, uh, Duke's mother, Charlotte, known as Granny, she's about this tall, uh, was welcomed into heaven. And she was packed full of dynamite. She wore gold sparkly shoes and silver sparkly shoes and bright fabric jackets. Well, I wanted, when I was at the house and we were cleaning things out, I asked one of the kids if I could take a jacket to make a pillow as a memento of Granny. And that kind of snowballed into, well, could you make 30 pillows for the family? And that just represents a family unit. That's not... It's a big family. Well, I made 30 pillows in four days. I could not sleep. I was so excited. There was such joy. I just could, it couldn't be contained. And I was sharing that with my sister. And she said, Anne, have you thought about, and so I wanted to offer that ministry to anybody free of charge who has lost a loved one. I will take your shirts, your pants, jackets, whatever, and I will make a pillow for your loved one as a blessing to you. And she said, have you thought about doing that for uh, fallen veterans' families? I got goosebumps all over, and I said, no, but let's do it. And so we have a new ministry called Patriot Pillows. Oh, I wanted to show you. This represents Granny, little Charlotte. This is a pair of her leopard capris, and I put jewelry on it. And then, sweet John Vic, con I contacted John, and he gave me some of his um, uniforms and things from his service in the Navy that were just, you know, hanging in the closet. And uh, this is made out of one of his very long pant legs and a sleeve and a medal that he left me. And I just want to extend this ministry to all of you, whether it's a civilian loved one or a veteran, and I have a little table over here to show you some more of the possibilities. I've got little uh, business cards to give you. I want the word to spread throughout Archuleta County. As long as my hands are able, I would love to do this as a blessing to those who have lost loved ones. So, thank you. Mm. Oh, thank you. I was reminding, reminding Annie this morning, that's what ministry is supposed to look like. You know, the excitement, the smiles, the enthusiasm, the l l let me at it. 
And, uh, and that's more and more what we want everyone to be able to find in ministry, whether it's here at Center Point or some other outlet in our little town, somewhere where you can serve and you can share the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ, where it can be seen on your face, where it can be heard in your voice, where it will be a testimony to the fact that it's, it's something that God has called you to do, he's gifted you to do, he blesses you as you do it, and it just brings so much joy that you could not imagine not being involved with it. And if you haven't yet found that little niche yet, uh, we would love to help you. Uh, uh, just, just call the office, stop by, set up a time when we can just sit down and visit and, and try to help you maybe isolate what it is in your life that brings you the most joy and how we can turn that into a ministry opportunity that serves the body of Christ or the greater community of Pagosa. Well, we're going to take just a moment and go to prayer. A couple of things that I did want to remember, besides Bart, uh, uh, we've got our, our big brother Tank up here on the front, uh, Shane, who lost his dad in just the last couple of weeks as well. And uh, we want to remember to pray for his family promised Ethan that we would pray specifically for their last uh, session, last few hours together this morning on their um, winter retreat with the teenagers, that God would move in just a really mighty way to change the hearts and lives of the kids that are there, some who maybe do not know the Lord yet as Savior, some who do but are still wrestling with full surrender, so many other issues. You know how hard it is to live in the day in which we are living. So let's just take a moment and pray for these requests together. Father, we humble ourselves before you, confessing that we are completely and totally unable to do anything that will last for eternity in our own strength and power. Lord, we depend on you to give us the words to say to give us the compassion to feel, to give us the enthusiasm to, to put into the, the ministry that you've called us to. We just, we just remind ourselves, Lord, that it is you working through us that will accomplish eternal results. And that's what we're after. We just want to commit to not only Patriot Pillows into your hands, but Lord, the other ministries that sometimes are not talked about a lot. They're kind of behind the scenes, service um, opportunities where people work quietly and they almost never get attention, but we are so grateful for them. We ask for your blessing, Lord, on all of these ministries, but I pray especially that you would open the door for Annie to be able to share the gospel and the love and the joy of Jesus Christ with many, many people in the, the days ahead. And we just ask that as a result of her responding to your promptings, that there would be many who will be in heaven because of this ministry. We commit that into your hands. Lord, we want to pray this morning for our brothers that are suffering and grieving and, and, and just experiencing loss in a very real way. Shane lost his dad, and I'm so grateful for the days and weeks that, that you gave um, in preparation for his homegoing. We just pray that you would comfort Shane, that you would draw him close to yourself, meet his needs and all the rest of his family, Lord. I just pray that you would strengthen him for this kind of this difficult part of the journey where you're suddenly without and having to deal with all that's involved. And the same for Bart. He's right now with his siblings and his mom, and Lord, there are great needs there. We pray especially that his mom would, would come to know Christ as her Savior as a result of um, the loss that she's experiencing. Give Bart wisdom and patience and love and compassion for his family. We just ask, Lord, that you would bless this next week that they have together and in the preparation for the service on Saturday that, that your name would be glorified and that you would especially be with Bart as he conducts the service. And, uh, and he leads and he speaks about his dad and he shares the gospel. Lord, would you just empower him to do exactly what you've called him to do. Lord, we have others that are still mourning the loss of a wife or a loved one, someone very special and important to them in their life. We have others that are facing those very diagnoses, and, and Lord, their life is in your hand. We have those that are struggling financially, those that are walking through depression and loneliness right now. 
so many needs in our church family, Lord, that only you can really meet. And so we commit each of these people into your hands. We pray that your blessing would rest upon them, your love would surround them, that you would make your presence known to them in a very, very special and tangible way, and that they would be encouraged and blessed to be reminded that you have not left them, you have not forsaken them, and that you will never leave them as orphans here on this earth. So we commit them into your hands, and even now as we look to some time together worshiping you in song and music. We just pray, Lord, that uh, everything that we say and do this morning would please you, would honor you, would glorify your name. And we'll thank you for it as we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand up and say hi to each other, okay? Greet each other, say hi. God bless you. Hi. In. All right. Good fellowship. I always hate to interrupt it. Good to have you all with us this morning. Hey, we're going to sing a lot of hymns this morning. I love hymns, but I don't want to be known as the hymn only guy. That's not who I am. I love all kinds of Christian music, all kinds of music. So I'm not a hymns only guy, don't think that. But today we're gonna to sing all hymns, all right? All creatures of our God and King. Songs of loudest praise, 
Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming sons above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love How many of you love the fountain? Fountain of salvation. Amen. Let's sing. There is a fountain filled with blood on from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain, lose all their guilty stain. shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we bleed. Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Savior art thou. 
Jesus is now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing thy thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. That God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on that cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away. How great is he? Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. And take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim Come on My God, how great thou art Then sings my soul Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art
Come on, sing it out. my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art Amen Praise you Father love you, Jesus, how great you are, in Jesus' name, amen. And all God's people said, uh, thank you, Forrest and Annie. That was like a hit list of uh, all-time best hymns ever, and I grew up on every one of those. <laughs> oh. I love for so much. He, he had, takes such delight in reminding me that he has the best job in the world. He gets to be here for the music, for the singing, the worship, and then he gets to leave when I get ready to preach. So <laughs> he is with the Hispanic ministry. They go out to the, uh, one of the side rooms and they have their own, their own service there. But uh, so thankful for him. Hey, before we begin, let's just take a moment, ask the Lord's blessing on the youth group and on us as we are in our time of study together. Father, we commit the youth uh, teens right now that are at the winter retreat. We just pray that during, I believe, this last session going on now, that your spirit would mer uh, work just in a mighty, powerful way. Father, we know that there are most likely kids there who have not yet maybe fully understood what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, maybe some of those who have not yet surrendered their life to him. We just pray that during this time, during this entire retreat, that your spirit would be moving to draw them to yourself. Uh, we pray that you would break down the barriers and you'd remove the distractions and you would cause each one of them to know that you are specifically speaking to them. And we can't wait to hear the reports of what your spirit has done uh, through this time. Lord, we're just trusting you to do what only you can do. And we really ask the same thing for us here this morning. We, we continue our worship now and the study of your word. Lord, I just pray that I would not mess up or get in the way or distract in any way from the beauty and the, and the uh, integrity of your word. Um, I ask that you would speak through me. I just pray that you would be the teacher and that you would guide and direct our thoughts and our hearts um, as we consider a subject that a lot of times causes division and yet it's not supposed to. Uh, we just ask that your spirit would be pleased to superintend over the entire rest of this service and Lord, even with our kids as they are uh, working out behind us and in the nursery. Just Lord, we want everything that happens here this morning to please you put a smile on your face and to cause you great joy as you reflect on how, how hard we, we want to please you. And so we'll just commit all of this into your hands and we'll thank you for it now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us since the beginning of the year, we really began in Second Peter with just a reminder, the Lord is coming back. And I just feel like uh, whether we do it every beginning of every new year or not, it's something that we need to remind ourselves the Lord is coming back. And Peter even makes the statement, because of everything that's going to happen, what kind of people should we be who live lives of holiness and godliness? And from there, we, we kind of moved over into the book of Thessalonians because there's so much great teaching about what we as believers have to look forward to. And we started in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, and that is the, the description of what we believe is being taught in that chapter on the rapture, the coming of the Lord, the parousia, um, as uh, compared to the revelation of Jesus Christ that we see at the very end of the, of the, gos of the gospel accounts in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. And that is the, re the revelation of Jesus Christ in his, in his glory and 
to bring judgment and wrath upon the unbelievers of the earth. So we see a, you know, a very distinct difference. We're looking forward to his coming. Um, and based on this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we believe that we are taught the rapture happens before the tribulation period. Now, I've been saying all along that, uh, you know, that if I stand up here and give you the impression that I've studied it out, I understand it completely, and this is the way it is, I just need you to know that's not the way it is. That, that, that does not determine that it's exactly the way it's going to happen. I've likened it to one of those million-piece puzzles where the shapes are all exactly the same, and you can put them together any way you want to, and you're trying to just use the little subtle nuances of colors and shapes and lines to come up with exactly what you think the finished product will look like. You know, kind of like on the front of the box. But some people don't see everything the same way. And I just, I don't think it honors the Lord when we argue and fight about who's right and who's wrong and who understands it and who doesn't. This is an issue that is not what we would call primary in importance of, of separation. I will not separate over a brother who thinks that we are going to be raptured at the middle of the tribulation period or even at the end of the tribulation period. I've had friends that they weren't even sure that there was going to be a, you know, a rapture. It was all going to be just done at the end of the tribulation period. So there's, there is wobble room. But doing the best I can and trying to understand and bring all this together, we're going to follow what I see is the kind of the, the more recent traditional conservative, conservative view to eschatology. And that is the Lord comes back before the tribulation period in the clouds of the sky to gather his church together, takes them to heaven for the duration of the tribulation period. And at the end of the tribulation period, we come with the Lord back down to the earth to set up his millennial reign. Now, we've made it through chapter 4. We've made it through chapter 5, which he then switches gears, and he goes right into a discussion on the day of the Lord, which is that, that second event. It's different from the rapture. I see that as happening at the really during the whole tribulation period, but culminating in the end of the tribulation period when he returns. And so now we move over into the second book of Thessalonians in chapter 2. And this is where we're going to pick up this morning. And, and what's really fascinating about this is that Paul writes another letter after this first letter to clear up what he thought he was making clear in his first letter. And I love it when people get confused because it gives us more scripture and more explanation and, and more to understand, and it helps us as well. And so in this second uh, book that, that, uh, that Paul writes to the same group of people, evidently there was some confusion about what he meant when he said in the first book, um, the Lord's coming back, it, it could happen any minute. Um, because when we pick up in chapter 2, just starting with the first verse, he says this. Now, concerning the coming, again, that's the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, two descriptions of the same event, kind of the, the, the laws of Greek grammar require that those two speak of the same event. He says, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. Now, going back, he's saying, to the first letter that I wrote you. Let's go back and talk about that again. The Lord's coming and the gathering together of Christians, we believe, in the clouds of the air. And I mentioned uh, last week the only other place that word is used in all the New Testament is in Hebrews 10.25, where it reminds us that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And we would see that as a reference to the body of believers, right? The church, the bride of Christ. And so the, um, Paul begins this discussion with kind of identifying what he's talking about, the coming of the Lord to gather his bride together. And he says, I want you to be sure that you're not quickly shaken in mind. You're, you're, you're not kind of buffeted around. It's a word that just kind of, you know, is pictured by a ship on a really really, really rough seas, up and down and back and forth, being kind of pushed around and buffeted around. It's the opposite of, of surety, of, of um, a stability. 
And he says, I don't want you to be shaken that way. And in your mind, I don't want you to be alarmed. I don't want you to be at your wit's end. I don't want you to be so worried about what I just explained to you in that last letter that you're all unsettled, that you're all worried, that you're all concerned, that you're losing your peace. He goes on to say why. It's because either by a spirit, evidently either someone in the congregation uh, pulled one of those um, statements where they say, hey, the Lord told me. Now, I don't know if you have friends that speak that way. Um, I love to qualify if, if, if they're talking to me. You know, I love to qualify and say, do you, do you mean that, that you felt an impression of the Lord? Or do you, are you telling me that the Lord spoke to you and told you this? Because if what you're saying doesn't come true, then according to Scripture, just so you know, I'm going to have to kill you when it's all said and done, right? It, it helps me just to remind myself, it is not a, it, it, it's frivolous, it's, it's not a, something to take lightly when we throw this around, well, the Lord told me, um, because we mislead others, we discourage others, we depress others when what we say doesn't come true, it doesn't come to pass. And so um, either someone in the congregation maybe stood up with that kind of a thought and said, well, hey, in my devotions, the Lord spoke to me in a very real way. And this is what he said. He said that we have already missed the rapture and we are already in the day of the Lord. And so Paul says, I don't care how you heard it, either by a spirit or by a spoken word. Maybe somebody else got up and preached a message. And that message said the same thing. Or what was the third thing? Or a letter that seems to be from us. Evidently somebody had forged a letter. And uh, you remember in Galatians, at the very end of the letter, Paul says, see how big handwriting I'm writing? You know, kind of Paul's, um, what we believe is his normal, um, you know, pattern was he would dictate, one of his associates would write. Um, you know, we believe he had an eye disease. We believe he maybe didn't see very well. We believe that maybe he had to write really big. And so to write an entire letter really big would have been a very, very difficult thing to do. So he, he would dictate uh, Timothy, Titus. You know, one of his, his assistants would write, would take down the dictation. And then they'd get to the end and it's kind of like, okay, Paul, now you need to sign it with your own writing. Just to verify that you really wrote it. And that's what he's saying. You received a letter. Or you, were, you were told you received a letter from me, even though I didn't send you another letter before, the, before this one. But however it happened, whatever method it was that you heard something that unsettled you and gave you information that was in complete disagreement with what I told you earlier, he said, I just want you to understand that you are to disregard that. I don't want you to be shaken in mind. I don't want you to be alarmed. Even if you've got all of these different avenues telling you that the day of the Lord has come. It hasn't come. Absolutely not. And he goes on really to, to explain it in verse 3. He said, let no one deceive you. And that's a really strong word for deceive. Let nobody under any circumstances, with any methodology, with any message, any way, anyhow, any time, deceive you. So be on your guard. Don't let this happen. Number one, he says this, the day, that day, the day of the Lord, he's talking about. Now, not the rapture. He's talking about the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ and all that leads up to it, will not come until a couple things happen first. And the first thing he mentions is the rebellion, the apostasy. It's from the Greek word that gives us apostasy. And the idea is falling away from a previously held position of a doctrinal sort, of a religious sort. The idea is a kind of defection from what a person would believe. And so Paul makes reference to something that we see going on all around us. It's, it's apostasy. It's this gradual kind of shifting, drifting. Uh, yeah, what happens to your boat when it comes untied? It just kind of starts moving out into the, into the deeper water. 
It's not necessarily intentional. It's not necessarily something that you decide, okay, I'm going to start engaging in apostasy. But it's, it's the way the world, we're told, will, will move. Christians will struggle more and more to stand firm, to stand strong, to hang on to what they've been taught. And so Paul says the first thing that will come is not this general rebellion, but he says the rebellion. It is a specific rebellion. It's one that um, he then adds to the description of the man of lawlessness is revealed. You know we're talking about the Antichrist. You know we're talking about that, that last, best, fullest, ultimate representation of all that is evil and wicked and ungodly. In fact, over in verse 4, um, he's described as being the one who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. This further kind of solidifies that Paul's talking about the Antichrist. Daniel has a lot to say about the Antichrist. And in Daniel, he's spoken of with all of these names. He's the little horn. Of Daniel 7 and 8, he's the prince who is to come in Daniel 9. He's the king who does as he pleases in Daniel 11. He's the foolish, worthless shepherd of Zechariah 11. He's the beast of Revelation 11, 13, 14, 19 on to the end of the book. He's called in this book the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, one whose coming is in connection with the activity of Satan. We know him as Antichrist. We understand that there will come a point in time where he will appear on the stage. He might very well be alive today. We do not yet recognize him as the Antichrist. And that's one of those interesting discussions that we have, you know, with others who are watching. Well, could, could it be this guy in this country? Well, no, I don't think he comes from that country. I think he comes from this country. All kinds of uncertainty but the, but the text teaches us that he will be someone who is so incredibly gifted. He'll be able to speak well. He'll be uh, very creative in coming up with, with ways to solve problems and issues. He will have a very severe or very intense look. He will be able to intimidate he will be able to, to, to strike fear into people and to cause them to do what he wants them to do. He is going to be a, a leader like this world has not seen in a really long time. Not a good leader, because he's going to literally be empowered by Satan. But verse 3 lets us know that when this, this man appears on the scene... He will, when the time is right, and we'll read this in just a second, when the Lord allows him to, he will kind of step up into the limelight. We believe the first thing that he will do that really, that really tips us off that he is the one is that he will establish a peace treaty with Israel. And he will become Israel's biggest and best defender and cheerleader. He will promise them peace like they've never seen it before. He will promise them security. He will promise them that they will have the the rights and the privileges that they enjoyed way back in the Old Testament. They will scramble to build a temple, even if it's just like a tabernacle type of temple, where they can reinstitute the uh, sacrificial system. And this Antichrist will, will give them everything that they want, and they will love him. For the first three and a half years. This is a a reference to who he is. He's called the man of lawlessness. He's also called the son of destruction. The only other person in scripture who was given that name was Judas. In John chapter 17, the son of perdition. And so if you will, the Antichrist will be a much fuller representation of the epitome of evil than even Judas was. Who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ before he went to the cross. This is perfect or complete or accurate identification that, that, that Paul wants these Christians to, to be able to grab onto because more than anything else, what he's trying to do is, is, is calm them. 
this isn't kind of a sensational, oh my goodness, let's talk about all the unbelievable things that are going to happen. He's just saying, no, 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 no. Let me give you something to hang on to. Because you're going to go through persecution. And, and I love this when it applies to us as well. You're going to go through persecution. You can't just immediately say to yourself, well, things are getting tough. We must be in the, you know, in the tribulation period. Things are going to get bad. Things are going to get tough long before the tribulation period starts. You see it in other countries. I read about in Finland, a, a doctor, a, a very prominent citizen in the town was um, charged with hate speech because she simply shared her understanding of what scripture teaches on subjects that are very offensive to people. And so they hauled her into court and they put her on trial. I haven't yet even heard how the trial has gone. We understand in Canada they've passed a law that they've made it illegal for even young people, even teenagers, to seek counsel from a pastor about the confusion over the homosexual LGTB movement. Uh, they, they just they want to understand, they want to maybe try to better figure out who I am, how I am, how did God make me. And if a pastor offers any kind of counsel that would encourage them to recognize their biological gender then that would become against the law and that pastor will be liable to stand trial for that. Just a couple of examples. We know this is coming. We understand it's, it's part of the, the process that's going to lead up to uh, the tribulation period. And so Paul's not doing a sensational study to try to, to give him every detail. He's just trying to give him enough to be able to say when the tough Stuff really starts to happen. Please understand that until you see the Antichrist revealed, until you see the rebellion happen, until you see these things happening, you're not in the tribulation period. And besides that, we expect, if we understand Scripture correctly, we expect that before the Antichrist reveals himself fully and finally, if you will, at the midpoint of the tribulation period, when he does exactly what verse says, uh, verse 4 says. He, he just takes down every other God that is worshipped in the earth today. And this isn't just about Jehovah God, but every so-called God, every object of worship. So you just for a minute think about every other religion who has a God they worship and serve. All of a sudden, that's going to be just as illegal as it will be for Christians to worship Jesus Christ. Every other church is going to be shut down. Every other synagogue, every mosque, every other place where worship took place those first three and a half years with the Antichrist blessing, with his encouragement, with the false prophet right at his, you know, his right side cheering him on, all of that is going to come to a screeching halt. And he is going to become God. He's just going to proclaim, I am God. You know, it might sound really weird to us, but every time another Caesar made his way to power, the very same thing happened. He would stand up and he would proclaim himself to be God. And if you weren't willing to offer a pinch of incense on the altar in sacrifice, you know, to Nero or Caligula or, you know, or Domitian, whatever the, the current Caesar was, then you could be excommunicated, you could be disallowed from doing any business, you might even be taken out and killed as a traitor or a subverter of the country. So we're going to be moving back into that kind of, that same scenario. So we need to understand that. We need to take to heart the very same things that Paul told the Thessalonian Christians, we need to take it to our heart. We need to be ready. We need to be watching. We need to be alert to what's going to happen. These will be things that will tip off a chronology that will not stop. It, it will continue until the Lord finishes his plan with the human race. But to these folks, in order to keep them from being what um, shaken in mind and just all upset and uncertain and unsure, he just says, just remember, you can't be in the day of the Lord until the Antichrist is fully revealed, 
and until you see this, this falling away up, you know, happen. So when he says in verse 5, don't you remember that when I was still with you, I kept telling you these things over and over and over again? I mean, I love the fact that Paul was only in this town for just, our best guess is just a few months. These were all brand new baby Christians. And yet Paul thought it was so important that he not only taught on the subject, but he taught on the subject over and over and over again. You know, there's sometimes when folks just say, you know, I don't want to talk about Revelation. All it does is we fight and argue about it. You know, I, I just, it's all going to pan out in the end, right? That's, that's all going to be fine. But Paul's example is you need to know enough so that you can be alert. You need to, to know uh, enough so that you won't be blindsided, that you won't be caught unawares, that you, that you won't worry and be fearful because you think something's going on that's not really going on. And so the stability that he's after, the, the confidence that he wants them to have in, in God's word is what he's really, really after. I told you these things over and over. And I told you, he says in verse 6, that there is a force that is restraining him now, the Antichrist. This whole system of evil that's just dying to break out. I mean, you and I have seen it in our lifetime, even in the last decade, if not much shorter than that, there is an increase to lawlessness. There is an increase to evil. There are things that are happening and going on that you and I never dreamed would happen and go on. You know, husbands murdering wives, uh, parents murdering children. People killing each other in cold blood over the most ridiculous things. Kind of this growing inability to even disagree and then turn around and walk away from each other. It's, it's like the something has snapped in the hearts, the, you know, the, the minds of people where they feel like it's their duty to squash whatever it is they don't understand, whatever they don't agree with. You know, this growing disrespect toward parents, growing disrespect toward our police force, our sheriff's office, uh, just the law of the land. All of this is what we are watching and observing, right? And we never thought we would see it. But there is, even in this progress, there is something that is holding it back from just finally and fully erupting. And that's what Paul talks about in verse 6. And you know what is restraining him. Evidently, Paul told them. He didn't spell it out, so he didn't tell us. And there's a lot of different guesses on what this all is that I'm not going to go through. Um, because even though they're fun to go through and interesting, really the only one that makes sense to me, because God has to be the one that's controlling the time, uh, of the revelation of the Antichrist is the Holy Spirit. And when he says that um, you know what, the reason why he says what is because here it's neuter. It's, it's, it's not referring to a person so much as it's referring to what that person does, the force that that person will exert in order to keep the Antichrist from, if you will, rising to the surface, he says, so that he may be revealed in his time. God is a stickler about time. God controls time. He controls history right down to the very second. Best case I can give you as an example is when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. You remember what the religious leader said when they met together? Okay, whatever you do, we're not doing anything during this feast, right? Because it, it won't end well for us. So they made this agreement, they made this pact that they would not pursue and do anything with Jesus during the feast. When was Jesus crucified? During the feast. Why did that happen? It was because Jesus was in control of the timing. And in just the same way, the Holy Spirit is in control of the timing of the revelation of the Antichrist. He is now being held back so that he can be and will be revealed in his time, that preordained time by God. Verse 7 says, the mystery of lawlessness. And you might say, well, what's so mysterious about it? We see it all around us. But what we don't understand, we don't get how bad it is going to be. 
the depth and the breadth and the width and the ugliness and the heinousness and every other word I can think of to describe this lawlessness is what you and I don't yet fully understand. If, if we could just see how bad it's going to be when the Antichrist is revealed, when the Antichrist is in power. I mean, you go to Revelation, and there's this one scene where there is a multitude under the altar, it says, and they're all kind of crying out, going, Lord, how much longer are you going to wait until you're going to avenge our blood on the one who literally you know, chopped our heads off? And the Lord's response is, just be patient. Not everybody who needs to die as a martyr for me has died yet. So we need more time for that to happen. So you have your robes, put on your robes, just relax. Got this under control, timing's all all figured out. You understand that during the tribulation period, there are going to be so many executions heartless, brutal executions, men, women, children, that it would, it would just absolutely, I think, be more than we could process. We would just be overwhelmed with this horrific feeling, heavy burden of just, oh my goodness, this is horrible. One after another, after another, after another. And I believe there'll be children being used to try to bribe parents to to renounce Christ. Take the mark of the beast. You'll have neighbors turning in neighbors because they're suspicious because they don't have the mark. And they're probably part of the bad guys. Just all of the, the normal relationships that you and I enjoy today are going to be turned and used against believers who refuse to take the mark of the beast. And we believe many, many, many people will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation period. This is that mystery. How bad it's going to be really hasn't been revealed yet. It really hasn't been exposed yet. It's already at work. We're moving in that direction. But it's just still kind of kept under wraps, at least the full breadth of it. And then he says this, only he who now restrains. Now we're talking about a a masculine pronoun. Now we're talking about a person. This person, the Holy Spirit, only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. It's not, and, and this is a possibility. It is a possibility that when the rapture occurs, that the presence of the Holy Spirit that is resident in all of the believers then will be ushered up into heaven. Uh, It doesn't mean that there will be no Holy Spirit on the earth because he's God and he's omnipresent. He'll always be on the earth. But what this really means is that he's going to, if you will, he's going to step aside and he's going to say, okay, Antichrist, do your thing. You got three and a half years to do your thing. And the Lord in Matthew said, if, if we gave him any longer, he'd kill everybody. But we've cut those days short because we don't want everybody to be killed. It's a, it, it's a horrible time. And Paul's, you know, his description of it is to the point, it's accurate, it's, it's what his, his new believers need to understand. They need to know this. This is what is going to happen. This is what it's going to look like. The Holy Spirit is holding him back and he will not turn him loose until the appointed time. When the appointed time happens, in verse 8, the lawless one will be revealed. Everybody will know it. Everybody will see it. It's interesting, and maybe you don't think about this often, but when the entire world suddenly is told they can no longer worship anybody but him, not everybody's going to like that. Not everybody's going to take that sitting down. There's, there's going to be more and more a, if you will, a, probably an underground movement against him. But this isn't going to make him real popular, which helps to understand us understand that by the time you get to the end of the tribulation period, you have armies marching, if you will, on Israel to take care of the Antichrist. 
Let's duke this out and whoever is standing at the end of the war will be in charge of the world. So all of this is, is going on at the same time. He will be revealed, but then just look how quickly Paul references even those, those last horrible days. It just says, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Whew. He's gone. I mean, the man who created a, a bigger stir in human history than arguably anybody else in all of human history will be gone like that. Please understand that the word kill does not mean in every case that his life will end. And we know that that can't be the case here because he is thrown alive into the lake of fire. That's what Revelation tells us. But that word kill really means to render inoperative. It means to, to make that person no longer effective. And if you will, the Lord is going to show up and the brilliance and the brightness of his coming is going to be so stark against the darkness of the world at that time. You know, one of the last bold judgments is that it's just going to be dark. The earth is going to be enveloped in darkness. If that's still going on, Jesus shows up. It's, it's going to be like a, you know, a super strong light after your eyes are used to darkness. It's just going to absolutely um, command everyone's attention. And when he shows up, the Antichrist will be done. He'll be brought to nothing. The Lord will grab him by the back of his neck, throw him in the lake of fire along with a false prophet, and that will be the end of his moving toward world domination. But to make sure that we understand who's behind it all in verse 9, Paul says, the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is by the activity, the energy of Satan. With all power, all of these supernatural signs and actions and, and miracles, things that will absolutely convince those who have rejected Christ that he is God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one to follow. So, uh, false signs and wonders, you know, the effect of all of that on them is just going to be like, wow. In fact, in Revelation, it quotes these people saying things like, who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? I mean, he is absolutely the most powerful person we have ever seen. And he can do incredible things that no man can do. And it's all part of Satan's plan and strategy to deceive and to take with him as many as he can into hell. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, for those who have rejected Christ. And this is so important for us to understand we get to the end of human history and it's so easy to to think well all of those poor people they didn't know and they hadn't heard and they didn't have a fair opportunity and it's not right and it's not fair but just look at the way that God presents those who have rejected him in verse 10 those that are perishing why because they refused to love the truth and so be saved They've been given a chance with the truth. They've been given the chance to hear the message. I just love, as, as you study through Revelation, there's 144,000 Jews who are trained evangelists that are sent across the entire earth. And they preach the gospel. And nobody can stop them. And nobody can answer them. And nobody can keep them from sharing the gospel. They are witnessing to everybody they come in contact with. There are two witnesses that are doing the same thing, I think, on probably a, a national global scene as they travel around. They are giving out the gospel. Here is the truth. This is an imposter. He is false. You know, here's God's word. Here's what it says. It's, 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 it's happening exactly the way he said it was going to happen. There's even an angel that at one point is, is just flying through the heavens, crying out, repent. Repent. Repent, come to Jesus, come to salvation. And this, this, this offer is just throughout the entire book of Revelation. So for those who are still perishing by this point in time, they're perishing because they refused 
They said, no, I don't want it. They rejected it. They rejected not only the truth of the gospel, but the truth who is the gospel, Jesus Christ, absolute truth. They did not want him, and so they were not saved. You remember John 3, 16, you know, you know the verse so well, God so loved the world, but you go on further, and it says he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is already condemned because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. For those who rejected the light, those who rejected the offer of salvation, those who rejected an invitation by the Savior, they will be the ones that are perishing. And it's because they refused. They absolutely refused. For many of them, repeated offers, repeated invitations, they refused. And so they will not be saved. Because in verse 11, it says that God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Best example I can think of is Pharaoh. Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. The Bible also says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the best way that I can wrap my hands around all of that is that God, in a sense, said to Pharaoh, is this rejection of what I'm trying to do? I mean, you, just, you go through every one of those 10 plagues, right? And after many of them, Pharaoh said, okay, I I give, you're God, I'm not. He had opportunities to hear, he had opportunities to see. God made it very, very plain. And God, at some point, if we were to play this out this way, showed up to Pharaoh and said, okay, Pharaoh, what's your final answer? I will not believe. I, I will not accept that you are God. And God says, okay, then let's make that your final answer. God steps in and finalizes the answer that you have determined is going to be your final answer. And he says, when that happens, those that have made that decision are going to be tricked. They're going to be deceived. And this isn't even Satan deceiving them. Now, this is God just saying, I'm going to give you what you want. Not what's best for you, but I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give to you what you're demanding. And you are going to believe the lie that is going to be told about what happened during the rapture. What's going on now? Just everything that's happening. There will be be a spin. You know there will be a spin to explain it all away. Those that have rejected will believe that lie so that they will not be saved. Because in verse 12 it says, In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that has been always the basis for salvation. Do you believe or do you not believe? It's not about works. It's not about legacy. It's not about heritage. It's not about what church you go to. It always, throughout all of human history, comes down to this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that his father raised him from the dead, brought him back to life? Do you believe that if you place your faith and trust in him, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that you will be saved? If you believe, Scripture says that you're saved. If you do not believe, then Scripture says you're lost. And that is what, what you know, ends up being the end of this whole discussion on end times it it comes down to that very thing do you believe or do you not believe maybe you're not sure maybe you wonder maybe you've got questions and maybe those questions are keeping you from making that final belief statement and placing your trust in Jesus Christ but you're not doing anything about those doubts you're not getting any of those questions answered you're just going on through life pushing it you know kicking the can down the road I'll take care of it later I'll deal with it later but 
for so many later gets there before they're ready. And they leave this earth and they never took the opportunity to weigh out all of the claims of Christ and to do the research. You know, I talk to people regularly that, that don't want me pushing anything down their throat. I, I'm not. I'm just asking you, please, would you just do some research? Would you just read this book? You don't even have ever, ever talk to me again, and that's okay. If you would just take steps to research what it is that you don't fully understand so that you can make an intelligent decision. That's all we're asking. And then the decision that you make or the decision that you put off until it's too late then becomes your final answer. And then there's no chance after that. The Lord wants us to have confidence. He doesn't want us to live in fear of the future. You know, what's the worst that they can do is kill you? Is that the worst that they can do? Or maybe it's the worst thing they can do is almost kill you and you end up in jail somewhere. You, you end up suffering, being tormented, tortured, whatever it might be. We don't live in fear. God's presence, his promises are with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He'll walk with us. And the many martyrs that are giving their lives around the world right now for the name of Jesus Christ, they, they don't have to worry. They don't have to live in fear. Why? Because it's a privilege. It's an honor to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul did not want his new young believers to be confused and fearful and worried. What he wants for them is to be able to live with the assurance that whatever happens and whenever it happens and however it happens, he's in control. And he will make it happen on his terms according to his time when he is ready. We just need to be prepared. If you're not prepared, I would love to visit with you. Or maybe there's someone else that you trust who knows the Lord. And you just want to sit and visit with them. Please do the research. Ask the questions. Find out what it is that's keeping you from accepting Christ before it's too late. Because the Lord is going to come back. And it's going to be sooner than many people will be prepared to meet him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clarity of your word. Whether we perfectly understand it or not, we understand enough to know that you're coming for us and we need to be ready. And I just want to pray for whoever might be here this morning who has not yet made that final decision to accept you as their Savior, that you would not let them leave this building until they visit with someone who can answer questions and show them from your word what it means to do just that. And for those of us that know you and those of us that love you, Lord, would you give us a burden for the many people in our lives who do not, uh, that we might love on them and go after them and share with them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. Thank you for promising to be with us until the very end, to walk with us and to care for us and to hold our hand when, when things get really, really, really bad. And I just pray that our faith and trust in you would not waver and that we would be strong and confident as we walk through these crazy days that we're in right now and are sure to get worse. Lord, may our walk please you. May our words honor you. And may the, the joy that we have in our heart just show on our faces for all to see. And we will thank you. Lord, be with us now. Give us a great week. Help us, Lord, to serve you faithfully, we pray in Jesus' name. Hey, thanks so much for being with us this morning. I hope you have a great week. God bless you as you go. You're dismissed.